So around my house, pretty much every meal, we do highlights, especially suppers. We talk about our highlights of our day, what was sort of your big moments of your day, what were the great moments of your day. And I was thinking about that this week. I was thinking, you know, it's not just highlights of your day that would be good to think about, but highlights of like your month or your year or I just thought, how big could you go? What would be the highlights of my life, right? Now, I actually just ask you this today. I want you to think right now. What are the two or three, maybe four, greatest moments of your entire life? If you were to think back. Some of you, you got a lot of thinking to do, right? Some of us were like, well, I've only been around a few years. You know, I could think through that pretty quick. But uh, first of all, I think as you think of that, the first few things that come to your mind may not be the things that last. I mean, it takes a while to think through your life and think, what were the greatest moments of my life? You, it might take you uh, a, a few weeks to really reflect on that and come up with, say, your four greatest moments of your life. But as you do, I could pretty much guarantee you that there are going to be two things that are involved in every one of the greatest moments of your life. And here are those two things. Number one, the greatest moments of your life will include other people that you love. Okay? It won't just be an isolated deal. It'll be a, a people deal. The second thing that I can almost guarantee is that the greatest moments of your life will include something, some kind of cause or purpose or big thing that's beyond you, that's bigger than you. And uh, actually, counselors and psychologists have known this for decades, that human beings are wired, right? Right in our DNA, we are wired for these two things, for connection with others and for purpose that's bigger than us. Actually, we have a name for that. When you're, when you're wired for something that's, that's outside of yourself, we call it transcendence. Transcendence. And the idea is that if, if you only live in your own little world, you have a pretty small world, right? Um, in, in fact, if you think of the greatest moments of your life and all you can think of are things that are by yourself and for yourself, that's a pretty sad, small life. And, and I actually think some of the struggles that we have in our current culture with, with people being down all the time, discouraged all the time, struggling with depression, sometimes I think part of the challenge with that is we live in a culture that has become so selfie-centered, so self-oriented and so isolated and so uh, uh, consumed with with uh, our own little worlds. Uh, so actually, life becomes more full, more rich, more, uh, there's more joy and more aliveness to life when you and I get uh, turned away from ourselves um, towards connecting with others and towards purposes bigger than ourselves. Uh, when, when we get, uh, and, and we all struggle with this. We all struggle because uh, we have this sort of natural inclination to turn in on ourselves, to just be focused on us. And, and of course, our world has a, a kind of a pull that direction. And so we have to uh, choose the other way. Uh, we have to learn the other way. Um, uh, uh, it actually says in the book of Proverbs, wisest man in the world, giving wisdom to his son. He says, look, uh, if, if somebody isolates themselves, they're seeking their own desire. They're selfish. They're isolated. And that breaks out against all sound judgment. In other words, that's the craziest thing you could do. And it's counterintuitive because in the moment, sometimes it feels like the, what I want to do. But the truth is, if you can see past this moment, you'll know that, that really, if you want a miserable life, just do those two things. Just be isolated and be selfish. And you'll be miserable as can be. And, and we see this in people's lives, don't we? I mean, we see it sometimes in our own lives. Uh, when, when, when I get isolated and selfish, uh, I, I begin to do destruction in my own life, and I actually hurt the people around me, too. Um, and the, the opposite is true. When you and I uh, get, get the other way, you ever met people who are amazingly um, unselfish, uh, not consumed with themselves at all, not even thinking about themselves? You know, a lot of times we, we, we ask the question, should I, be, uh, should I have self-hatred or self-love? You know what the biblical answer is? Neither. Be self-forgetful. Just don't think about yourself. Forget about self-centeredness. Right? It's a beautiful thing when Scripture calls us to love God and love people. And then to live our lives, not for us. I mean, the, the, the mantra of our world is take care of yourself. Look out for number one. And it's a recipe for misery. So, so the Bible says, hey, there's a better way. In fact, when God calls you to new life, and, and he forgives you of your sin, and he pours his love on you, and he, he, he says, man, I'm going to bring you into a relationship with me through my son Jesus, right? And what Jesus did on the cross and dying for your sins. 
and you experience that new life, you know the first thing you learn when you get into new life is that you've been invited into a community of people who have a purpose bigger than themselves. It says Ephesians 2.10 says, God created you anew in Christ to do good. To do good. Or uh, 2 Corinthians 5 says that Christ died for our sins. He rose again for everyone so that they would no longer live for themselves but for him. Or go right back to the book of Genesis, Abraham. God calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going I'm to send you out. You're going to go to a land you haven't known. And there I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make you awesome. I'm going to make you famous. But then the real key is the very next line. And you will be a blessing. You're going to be blessed, but, but there's purpose in it. It's so that you can be a blessing. We call this the kingdom way. It's what, what we learn all through scripture. There's a kingdom way. There's a better way of life. A, a way you can learn to, to, to not be about yourself, but to be about God and others, uh, both in relationship and in purpose. Uh, a way of, uh, of learning that, that life is actually counterintuitive in the way you might think. That the way up in the kingdom of God is down. It's to serve. That the way to be blessed in the kingdom of God is to be a blessing. That uh, the way to actually experience life in the kingdom of God is to lay down our lives. That sacrifice is the path of joy. And it, it, it's counterintuitive, but it works. It works, and it's beautiful when it happens. Now, if it's beautiful when it happens in one person's life, imagine how amazing it is, and this is the key to the whole message today. Imagine how amazing it is when that happens to a whole community of people. When God actually brings a whole community of people together and says, it's not about you. It's about relationship with God and others. It's about being a community. And even as a community, it's not about you. It's about living together, teaming up together for purposes bigger than yourself. That's what the Bible calls the church. The church. And in the, uh, in the scripture, we got all this instruction for the church. One of the books written to the church is the book of 1 Corinthians. Okay, And Paul writes this. And if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or go on your uh, mobile device and find that chapter. Says, We're going to look at it today, but the Apostle Paul writes this book to the church, and, and basically he says, look, Corinthians, you guys are awesome. God's put you in an awesome family. He's gifted you in powerful ways by his Holy Spirit. He's given you this amazing and huge mission to accomplish together, but you know what? Corinthians, you've gotten distracted. You got fighting with each other. You got jealousy. You got pride. You got competition. Instead of helping each other live better lives and get closer to God, you're trying to get things from each other. You got judgmentalism going on, and on and on it goes. In fact, when I talk to leaders or pastors or friends who are down about their church, you ever met somebody who's down about their church? Right? They're just like, oh, it's not going good. There's a lot of fighting, gossiping, blah, 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 all these negative things. I'll often say to them, hey, you should read 1 Corinthians. Because when you find out how bad it was there, you're going to feel real good about how, how you are where you are. You know? so it's, a, it's a mess in, in 1 Corinthians. And yet Paul doesn't just throw in the towel and say, give up. Man, you guys are too messed up. No, Paul still has hope because he knows the power and the beauty and the wonder and the potential when God's church begins to get these things right. And Paul doesn't give up on the Corinthian church because he knows there's no perfect church. I mean, if there's going to be people together, there's going to be challenges. But we can get better. And we're going to just look at how to get better together today in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, it, the context is that he's talking to them about their spiritual gifts. And in that context, then he's saying, hey, it's, it's not about you. Um, it's not about showing off. It's not about being insecure or competing. Um, you have awesome gifts, often, awesome power. What if you team up? Imagine what would happen if you got together and said, we're going to serve the world. We're going to accomplish the huge mission God has for us. So I think this chapter should be called Church is a Team Sport, or we could subtitle it, It's Not About You, <laughs> okay? And so uh, uh, let's just read it together. I'll, we'll start with the first three verses here. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding the question about spiritual abilities the Spirit gives, I don't want you to misunderstand it. You know that while you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So it says, man, back in the day, you were into all this idolatry, which was real common in that day. And it was kind of crazy. It was all frenzied up and, and, and wild, but that's not the way of Jesus. So what is Jesus' way like? I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he goes, here's how you can know 
if this is really the Spirit of God working, does it exalt Jesus? Right? It's not about you or your involvement or how good or bad you are. It's does it exalt Jesus? If it's bringing people closer to Jesus, <laughs> if it's making Jesus look good, it's about him, then there's a good chance it's the Holy Spirit involved. So verse 4. He says there's different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There's different kinds of service, but the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of them. So what do you notice here? Well, you, you notice that there's diversity and sameness. Diversity and sameness. Diversity, unity. Well, how can you have both of those things? Well, Paul does, and actually for the whole rest of the chapter, you're going to see these two things just back and forth over and over again. What Paul is saying is he's saying, actually, for you guys to experience true unity, don't think that you all have to be the same. Your diversity is a good thing. You should celebrate the differences in your midst. Sometimes we think unity means just uniformity. It means I just have to conform to, to the way everybody else is. I just have to be the same as everybody else. It's kind of like peer pressure, right? I just got to be the same as everybody else. No, actually, uh, our differences make us beautiful, right? They, 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 it would be boring if we were all exactly the same. You with me? Man, I'm glad not everybody's like me. Sometimes I want everybody to be like me, but I'm glad they're not, right? And, and so, so we have differences, sometimes differences of opinion, sometimes differences of strengths and weaknesses, sometimes differences of ways we would do things. Paul says, that's all good. Celebrate that. But here's the deal. There's some things that are the same that will really unify you. Or, or let me put it this way. You need certain things that unify you that are stronger than your differences so that you get over your differences to be connected together. And in this case, what we're going to find out through this whole chapter is we're going to find out that what really unifies the, the, the church of Corinth or what ought to be unifying the church of Corinth is that they have a mission that they need to accomplish together. In other words, if you have something big enough to fight uh, 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 on together, then you don't have time to fight with each other, right? I mean, if you're all squabbling amongst yourselves, and then you look up, and you go, oh, we, gotta, we, we got that, that, you forget about your, your, your squabbles, and you get about the mission together. So uh, let's continue on to look at, at, at how this looks. What actually, this chapter is going to have five things it gives us. We're only going to look at two of them today. God willing, we'll look at the other two next week. So we'll do about half the chapter today. But this is the first one. He says, you have different gifts, but there's the same giver, the same source, the same Holy Spirit, the same person gave those gifts to you. And because of that, you, you wield power, but the power is not yours. You all wield power. You all have the, the, the Holy Spirit within you, but that's not your power. That's someone else's power. You're the steward of it. In fact, your whole lives, everything you have, everything you are is a gift from God. And so even though it looks different in all of you, it's a stewardship that you have in common together. Okay, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another one, the, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. So uh, you're praying for each other, or you're talking together, or you're thinking of a friend, and God supernaturally by His Spirit gives you some wisdom or gives you some knowledge that's going to bless that person and help that person. You share it with the person. The person goes, how'd you know that? You're like, ah, it's not me. It's God. Supernatural. God uses this person. The same spirit gives great faith to another. So uh, we all have faith, but there's sometimes when the spirit of God gives a gift of faith to a person. And they just believe. They're just like, yes, this is happening. I'm believing it. And you're like, wow, that's really cool. God gave you that gift. And to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. So they pray for somebody, the person gets healed. You're like, awesome. He gives to one person the power to perform miracles. There's another deal. The Holy Spirit moving there. Here, let's see if we can get there. Yeah, perform miracles. Um, and another person, the ability to prophesy. So it's God sharing something with somebody else through us. So we, we feel like God wants us to share something with somebody else. We share that. That's a, what we would call a prophetic word when we share what we feel God is asking us to tell someone else. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person, the ability to... Uh, sorry, let's just pause at that one. So this person, they don't know how, but they just know this is God or this is not God. 
It's just God enables them to know. They wouldn't know it any other way, but God enables them to know. And then another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another person has the ability to interpret what has been said. We call this speaking in tongues, right? And there's different kinds of this in Scripture. Uh, uh, sometimes in Scripture, a person is actually speaking a known language. And they're, they don't know the language, but the Spirit of God enables them to speak a language so that they can communicate with somebody else. And this actually, if you look through church history, there's lots of accounts of this on the mission field. People are trying to reach a, a, a people group where they couldn't know the language, and God just supernaturally gives them the language. Um, so that's one form of speaking in tongues. Another one is what we call the prayer language of tongues, where people just pray out in tongues, and they just uh, uh, are, are communicating between themselves and God. Often they don't even know exactly what they're saying. They just know they're praying in words that they can't express in their own mother language. And then there is in this case where it says, you know, somebody gets, gets a word in tongues, and then either they or somebody else knows what it means. So they're probably speaking in like a heavenly language, but they or someone else knows what it means, and they interpret it. And then the people who are around are blessed by hearing a word uh, that God would want us to hear. So this is really cool, right? God moves in powerful ways through ordinary people. Isn't it neat that God does that? It's actually every one of these words for gift here is, is charisma. It means grace gift. It means you didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. You didn't like make it all happen. You don't deserve to have that gift. Aren't you glad God uses us in spite of us? How many of you appreciate that about God? Man. God doesn't pick, you know, people who are, have it all together. Um, what, what is one guy, he said it this way. He said, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call, right? It's just, it's just God just finds us broken people, and he uses the likes of us. It's a beautiful thing. And, and so the emphasis then, here it is in verse 11. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So this is the deal. When you understand that it's God's grace, that it's God who did it, that it's God's power doing it, when somebody comes up to you and says, that's so awesome you had that gift of faith, that you could just believe that and saw God work in that powerful way, you're so cool. You smile, and you think to yourself, I'm not that cool. I'm not even that awesome. Because really, the truth is, it's God who's awesome, and it's God who's so cool, and it's God who's so amazing. I'm just me. But the Holy Spirit is at work in and through us. And, and so we, we say to ourselves, it's not, not for my glory, it's for his glory. In fact, um, in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul actually gives a, a list of, of gifts. And by the way, this list here, uh, there's nine gifts listed that we just looked at. That's just a, a sampling of the ways God uses people. Okay? Paul's not trying to give you like, here's the nine. You, know, you pick, you know, see which of the nine you have, and now you'll know. Uh, later on in the chapter, he gives another list. Romans chapter 12, he has a list. Ephesians chapter 4, he has a list. The, the, the point is, God uses all of us in unique ways. So, you, you know, don't think of this as just like, well, these are the nine, and now that's it, and you've got to define them just so. No, it's just the Holy Spirit moves through people in power in various ways. Uh, so, so in Romans 12, where he makes a, a, a list like this, he starts, before he gets into it, he says, hey, make sure, as we're inviting God to use us, that you have humility, that you remember it's not about you, because really it's, a stewardship. It, it's a gift from God. That's where it all comes from. I love in 1 Peter 4, he describes it. God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So what do you do? Manage them well. It's a stewardship for all of us. We're all different. We all have different abilities, different gifts, different strengths, but it's a stewardship so that God can be given glory. You see, if it's about your glory, you look for the most glorious jobs. But when it's about God's glory, you just look for where you're needed, where you can serve, where you can be helpful. That's what you look for, not for the glorious things. Uh, um, that's, that's why when, when we bring those things, we just say, man, God gave me talents, not for a talent show, not to show off, but God gave me talents so that they could be used, used. You ever, uh, sometimes I'll have somebody say, this, I went to that church and they used me there. I got used. I'm kind of like, awesome, <laughs> right? So good. Praise God for a church that actually uses you. You know, you're like, well, I don't want to get used. Well, then you got church backwards. You see, I, I, in fact, I'll get into this a little bit later in, in a few minutes, but, but the, I think the main issue with the North American church is that we become consumers instead of contributors. We've misunderstood what the church is. The church is a missionary enterprise. We have a mission to accomplish, and we mean to be used. We come together, and we bring our time and our treasure and our talents, and we say, God, it's all yours. It's your mission. Let's go. 
That's the church. Somebody say amen to that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> That's the church. The church isn't a place. I just, I just need to be blessed. I just need help. I just, I just need, need, need. No, no. I've been blessed. God loves me. God fills me. God wants to use me. So, Pat, you know, a uh, 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 church. Uh, anyway, I'm getting all fired up there. Okay, you get it, right? Uh, one more thing, because I'm meddling a little bit. One more thing, and then we'll go on. But, um, you don't need a platform to serve. Okay, and here's what I mean. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I wanted to serve, but nobody would let me. You know, I, nobody gave me permission. So, so say somebody has a teaching gift. They say, I have a teaching gift, but nobody gave me a microphone. Nobody gave me a platform, so I can't use my teaching gift. So pff, can't believe that place. Here's the deal. If you have a gift, just start serving people with it. Just start using the gift. You don't need a platform to serve people. Who are you going to serve with your gift? I'll tell you who you'll serve. The people around you. Your family, your friends, you know, the, the, the people you meet, just start serving people. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I found out I had a teaching gift. I just, because I was learning things, and I had this thing in my heart, I want to share those with people, and I just started sharing them. I didn't get given a platform. Nobody gave me a microphone. I just started sharing those things with people. And I'd share them, guess with who? Uh, my family, my friends, people around me. And I found out pretty quick that people don't really want to hear from you unless they know that you love them. Right? I was like, ooh, I better learn how to love people. And then I started loving people, and I found out pretty quick people don't want to hear from you unless you've got character, right? Unless they see proven track record in your life. And I was like, oh, I better work on my character. And then I found out pretty quick people don't want to hear from you unless you have content, right, that actually helps them. So I'm like, ah, oh, I better get some content. You develop those gifts. You use them. Just use them to serve the people around you for the glory of God. That's what stewardship is. We take our whole lives, our time, our treasure, our talent, and we say, Lord, you're the source of it all. We have that in common. And that leads us to the second thing, which is we have different capacities, but we have the same cause. We have a common purpose. We have a common stewardship, but we also have a common purpose. So let's read that in the next verse. Uh, this is verse 12. It says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. And we're going to cover the rest of this passage next week. So skip to verse 27. It says, all of you together are Christ's body. Each of you is a part of it. And then uh, here he lists out the, another list of special gifts. And he says, you're all different. And it's good that you're all different. Okay, that's, that's not a bad thing. You shouldn't all try to be the same. And then he ends the chapter with verse 31. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Let me show you a better way of life that is the best <laughs> of all. And where he's going here is he's going to teach us chapter 13. Is what we know as the love chapter of the Bible. He's going to say, hey, look, look. The purpose of your gifts is to serve. The power of God is for a purpose. The Holy Spirit's power in your life is never for selfishness. It's always for service. And, and that's why he, he says you're the body of Christ. You see, if, you're, if the power that God has put on your life is for service, or your time, treasure, and talents are for service, then, then what kind of service? Well, the kind of service that makes you the body of Christ. Because here's the deal. When you're the body of Christ, whatever his mission is, is yours. And the message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that heaven is invading earth. That, that, that humanity is suffering and in sin. And God is not just sitting back uncaringly. God is, is coming to rescue and redeem. Uh, God is a missional God. And nowhere is that mission shown more powerfully is, than in Jesus. Jesus embodies the mission of God. And wherever Jesus goes, he sets people free, he heals, he brings forgiveness of sins, he loves them, he envelops them into community, uh, he, he gives them a, a greater purpose for their lives, he calls them into purpose, he brings the kingdom of God. And he dies on the cross, he rises again, then he heads to heaven, and he doesn't say, okay guys, mission's accomplished, let's go to heaven, call it a day. He says, actually, as I go to heaven, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and you are going to continue the mission. You are the body of Christ. You're the hands and feet of Jesus, church. You're Jesus now to this world, and you're going to continue the mission that God has. And that's the purpose that God has given us. Uh, J.D. Greer says it this way. He says, the church is not a hovel of saints cloistered together trying to keep out the barbarians, but a missionary people battering hell's gates. That's what the church is. And we learn together to be that kind of people, a people of love and service and generosity and selflessness, and to live for a purpose bigger than ourselves, to, to, to minister. 
I believe that the number one hindrance today to church growth, to church effectiveness, to the church accomplishing its mission around the world is what I would just call a lack of unity. And, and what I mean by a lack of unity isn't, just like our text is telling us, isn't that we all have the same opinion about everything or we all look the same or act the same or talk the same. What, what I mean by a lack of unity is a lack of coming together around the purpose that God has given us and saying, let's all, every single one, work together, not as consumers, but as contributors to getting the mission done in the world. Uh, Wayne Cordero puts it this way. He says, the influence a church has on its community will be determined by the percentage of involvement of the ministry of each member. This marks a transition from attendance to ownership, from being consumers to contributors. That's real unity. That's when, when everyone works together to carry the load, to bring something to pass. Every church, every church, this church included, is where it's at, is, is, has made as much advancement as it's made. Not because it has a great pastor or a great set of leaders in this area or a great music or a great kids program or a great building, as much as those, all those things help. Every church has advanced the kingdom of God as far as it has, only as far as its people have invested their time, treasure, and talents to bring it there. Because that's it. Uh, we are the church, right? We don't go to church. We are the church. The church does not exist for us. We're the church, and we exist for the world. So let me just, as I uh, head towards closing, you know what it means when a pastor says, in closing? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. That's what it means. Okay. Um, let me just read you this, this neat story. This is James Emery White. He's a pastor. And uh, he's speaking at a conference, and he's talking about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the benefit of using contemporary music to reach a new generation and to reach people who maybe didn't grow up in church and so on. So he's talking to all these church-type people about doing that. And uh, at the end of this, he, there's this elderly lady who had a cane who, who comes uh, up to talk to him. And he says it was, it was kind of funny because everybody's going that way and uh, 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 there's a big room and this elderly lady starts coming towards him, but she takes a real long time, you know, it's like, all right? And so, like, here she comes. He can see her for, like, half an hour getting there. And uh, she finally gets to him and she, she points at him and she says, young man, I want to have a word with you today about what you said tonight. And he thought, oh, man, here it comes. She says, are you trying to tell me that churches should use contemporary music to reach people today? And, and he says, now, I just spent a good deal of effort, effort saying just that. But after looking at her cane, I very politely says, ma'am, I don't know. It might help. What do you think? <laughs> and she said, young man, I want you to know that Montavani is about as contemporary as I get, unless it's the weekend and then maybe Lawrence Welk. I don't even know who those people are, but it's pretty good. And then she held up her cane, pointed it right at his face, and then said this. This is so awesome. So, if rock and roll is what it takes to get people back to church, all I've got to say is, let's boogie. Let's boogie. <laughs> it's not my style of music, but if it will reach people for my Jesus, I like it. And then she said, besides, the church doesn't exist for my needs. It exists to win the world. And listen, it's that kind of holy fire, that kind of passion for a mission that will cause us to unify and get over whatever differences we have and even celebrate the differences we have so that the mission could get accomplished together. That's what it says about the early church in the book of Acts, right? It says they devoted themselves. And oftentimes, it's the leader's job around a place to call people to that kind of devotion, to step up, to get out of the stands and get into the game, to, to put a, a, a skin on the... In, in the game and to say, you have the Holy Spirit, you have resources, you have time, treasure, and talents that you can invest in that. And I'll just be honest with you, as a leader, um, sometimes I, I don't love that part of my job. Um, sometimes that's scary for me. This week I was wrestling with that. And I just, when I do that, I have to remind myself, look, this isn't about me, it's not for me. This is for God. This is for the cause of Christ in our city and in our community and really around the world. And, you know, the truth is, it's also for you. Because here's what you need to understand. Your own glory is too small a thing to live for. Your own glory is too small. 
that actually the greatest moments of your life when you look back will be those very moments where you said, ah, I'm getting out of the stands. I'm getting on the field. I'm giving, giving myself to a community of people and to a cause that's bigger than me. So just as we close, I want to invite you. If you're part of this church, if you attend here, maybe you're new here, or maybe you've been here a long time. I want to invite you not just to be um, a congregation member. I want to invite you to be a minister. And we say this a lot around here, right? We're, we're all ministers of the gospel together. I want to invite you to get skin in the game in every part of your life, in your time, in your treasure, and your talents. Invest in this mission. I, I believe you'll be glad you did. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's all kinds of excuses, all kinds of reasons why we say, ah, maybe not. You know, I think a lot of us go, oh, it's a big church. Probably doesn't need my little contribution. Hey, listen, the bigger the church, the more essential it is that a larger percentage of people say, we're in this together. We're walking together. We're going to see lives change together. Uh, we're going to work together to see God do great things in our midst and in our city. So um, <laughs> that's the invitation. That's the call. And, and here's the beautiful thing. I've seen this over and over again. I, I see it every week around here. I see people saying, I'm in this. I want to accomplish this mission together in, in, er, er, with every part of my life. And every time I see it, I just go, oh, there's a work of God. There's the power of God at work. It's a beautiful thing. We, around our church, we have what we would call paid staff and unpaid staff. That's it. That's all we got. If you attend here, you might not know this, but you're either paid staff or you're unpaid staff. But either way, you're staff. You can tell pretty quick if you get a paycheck from here or not. You know. Okay? But here's the deal. Whether you're paid staff or unpaid staff, you work here. This is your church. This is your mission. This is your calling. And some of you, I got to call you to work. You know, get to work, man. Right? We got a job to do. So, so for all of us, and really just for all of us, let's, let's ask ourselves, God, would you use me? Use me for your glory. Let's stand. Let's close in prayer.